Greetings, welcome to our Center Place History, Theology, and Philosophy lecture series. It's the Christmas season once again, and so our topic tonight is looking at prophecies in the Christmas stories. And if I can have access to the slides. Thank you. So, in telling the story of Jesus' birth, the Gospel of Matthew explicitly states four times, quote, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. So Christians, early Christians, saw Jesus' life as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. So what the things we want to ask tonight is, what do the examples uh, that Matthew and Luke are, are using uh, what do they tell us about early Christian understanding of how prophecy works? So, before there were any uh, Gospels written, uh, Paul, who is the first Christian writer whose works survive, recorded his own take on the good news or the Gospel uh, as it's drawn from Jesus' life. And so this is sometimes called a, a proto-Gospel, Paul's announcements of the good news, a pronouncement it's sometimes called the kerygma, or pronouncement. I handed on to you, he writes in 1 Corinthians, I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So though, Although Paul had never met the historical Jesus, he's just an incredibly influential church thinker who was active uh, shortly after Jesus' death in the movement from the 30s through the 60s of the common era of the AD era. So Paul planted Christian churches in Greek-speaking cities uh, of the Eastern Roman Empire. And he would generally speaking find converts especially among Gentiles, Greek-speaking non-Jews, who were God-fearers already. In other words, people who um, had been attending Jewish synagogues among the large diaspora Jewish communities in those cities, uh, but who were not able to convert to Judaism or didn't want to convert to Judaism because of um, a lot of the very complicated and um, uh, dietary and other, other rituals that required, uh, that conversion required. And so uh, when these uh, Gentiles who already believed uh, that the God of the uh, Hebrew Bible was God and who already sort of uh, converted to that religion find um, uh, this character, Paul, who tells them, well, you don't actually have to, um, uh, you don't actually have to get circumcised. You don't actually have to follow all of these dietary restrictions and so forth uh, because there's good news, uh, this good news of Christianity within this uh, a new sect of this religion. So Paul's writings tell us a great deal about the churches that looked to him for leadership. So he is organizing small community worships. They are involved in praying and singing, reading scriptures, rituals like uh, ritual meal together, uh, forerunner of communion, and so forth. Their focus already was on what we sort of think of as a high Christology. So their focus in terms of Jesus is on Jesus as Christ, Jesus as the Messiah, and then also Christ or the Messiah as Lord, as God's word or glory. So they were also focused on being themselves uh, and, and themselves incarnating the body of Christ. And so these Christian or high Christi Christological ideas were already really present in Paul's writings and in his communities, rather than, for example, uh, details of Jesus' life or Jesus' teachings. So Paul very rarely actually quotes any of Jesus' teachings, um, and his, his summary of what's important about Jesus' life is hardly any longer than what that little quote we read in the Kerygma. So, Paul is not the only church leader, though. Um, there are also uh, people who are probably, or at least sometimes, rivals of Paul's. Uh, the degree to which is not clear. Paul tries to um, uh, make it seem like they're not as uh, antagonistic to him as perhaps they were. 
So Paul describes other churches led by what he calls, quote, the acknowledged pillars of the faith. And these included Jesus' own disciples during his lifetime, Peter and John, as well as Jesus' brother, James. Uh, and those uh, disciples, and especially James, dispute some of Paul's ideas about Mosaic law and these new uh, Greek-speaking Gentile Christians, whether they have to also obey Jewish law, Mosaic law, or not, the way Paul will have it. So, like Paul, who we know as a historical figure, uh, James is a known historical figure. Uh, Paul actually states that he met James, so we have um, a confirmation there. And we also have uh, a recording of James's assassination in the uh, works of the Jewish historian Josephus. Um, some of Jesus's, Josephus's uh, writings about early Christianity uh, were tampered with by later Christians, but most scholars uh, assert that the part that he writes about James as opposed to about Jesus um, is probably all authentic uh, Josephus. Okay, so James's church versus Pauline Christianity. During James's life, his group may have been called the poor of Jerusalem. And so when Paul is writing about the poor in Jerusalem or when in the Jamesian uh, books they are talking about uh, the poor, we're thinking maybe about a, a mendicant group, a group that um, you know, has sold all that they have and is living uh, by alms uh, in, kind of in a kind of contemplated intentional community that, um, uh, where the poor are, are blessed and so on, and they pray each day for their daily bread and live by those kind of alms. They also may not have shared Paul's high Christology, nor even called themselves Christians. Um, the book of Acts talks about how uh, the term Christian uh, first appeared uh, not in the local area of Jerusalem where Jesus was around in Galilee and Jerusalem, but rather uh, up in Syria in Antioch. Although written in the tradition of James's church, the letters of James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and Jude in the New Testament, um, and so Jude here is, describes himself as being the brother of James, and so James is the brother of Jesus, so Jude is also the brother of Jesus. Um, they are not written by those actual historic figures. So these are uh, written in their names, but are in fact not, uh, we don't have any actual writings from these uh, early his, uh, historical figures. So in the letter of James, um, sayings, teachings that are otherwise attributed to Jesus are sometimes attributed to James. So it may be that these are um, ideas or doctrines or, or wisdom um, that is just in, indigenous to the community. And in some places they're ascribed to Jesus uh, in the sayings, gospels, and in the uh, later gospels. But in maybe in Jesus' literature, it's something that James would say. Um, the author of the letter of Jude identifies himself, as I say, as the brother of James, not Jesus. So, um, in that sense, it may be that James's group wasn't as focused on Jesus as Paul. So Paul is very, Paul's groups, again, um, are very focused on Jesus as Christ and that high Christology. James's church may have seen Jesus as simply one of several prophets whose testimony was sealed by martyrdom alongside an earlier prophet, John the Baptist, and of course, ultimately, James himself, who also uh, was martyred. Um, we have several indications that the historical Jesus may have actually been uh, or begun his ministry as a disciple of the historical John the Baptist, another leader in this movement. All right, so that's the earliest beginnings of what we can kind of glean from it. Um, so by uh, the time we get to the, uh, the 60s and the 70s, both Paul and James were martyred during the 60s, and so they're no longer rival leaders, they're gone. Uh, and the first Roman-Jewish war breaks out, uh, causing, uh, resulting in the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, ultimately, and the temple. So from 66 to 74, there's all sorts of people at the time, including early Christians, who see this as an actual sign of the end times, and they really think that the end is, is nigh. Um, as that happens, or maybe right before that happens, as the war breaks out, 
the remnant of James's uh, Jewish Christian group in Jerusalem fled to a town called Pella in Jordan, and uh, they may have ultimately become what later Orthodox Christians call or describe as the Ebionites. Uh, the word Ebion sounds like a word for poor, so this Ebionite sect um, may have uh, been grown out of the exiled um, Jamesian church. Now, ultimately, though, the Ebionites, they're known to have a gospel. Uh, it was declared heretical. That gospel is now lost, and the Ebionites are, are extinct. So we don't know uh, for sure everything about that. only thing we know about the Ebionites, really, are what their enemies wrote about them. Okay, so that's kind of backstory, and we still haven't gotten to a Christmas story as yet, but I want to um, kind of explain where these are coming from. So that's what we have before there are any long-form Gospels written. So the earliest of those Gospels we have is the Gospel that is uh, attributed to Mark. So of the four uh, Gospels in the canon, uh, most scholars date Mark's composition to the time period after the destruction of the temple in 70, but before the end of the Jewish war, uh, because the author here is quite apocalyptic. The author of the Gospel of Mark really thinks that this is end times happening, and they're not necessarily aware yet of the en actual end of the war. So although this text has traditionally been attributed by Christians to a guy named John Mark, who is a character associated with Paul in the book of Acts. The actual text is anonymous, um, so that attribution got added onto the text uh, decades, a century later, uh, and is not part of the, the text in no way claims, I, Mark, am writing this, I, Mark, who knew Paul or who knew Jesus or anything. Uh, rather, the unknown author, the anonymous author, was not an eyewitness to uh, events in Jesus' life. All then that is known about the author of the Gospel of Mark is the information that can be inferred from the Gospel itself. So the author of Mark had access, apparently, to a set of sayings attributed to Jesus. Now these could have been just in their community, their Christian community, um, people had an oral tradition and were repeating these kind of things. Uh, because the author of Mark doesn't seem to have access to um, the known written saying gospels that might have been around at the time, the gospel uh, that scholars call Q, or another hypothetical text, a proto sayings gospel of Thomas that might have started to be written down the earliest form of what we now have in form of the sayings gospel of Thomas. Those might have been around and circulating. Mark, the author of Mark, doesn't have those. Um, in the past, uh, scholars have uh, hypothesized that there might have been a, a Passion Week or an Easter um, gospel that maybe Mark had as a pre-source, pre-Markan source. The problem with that uh, is the more analysis that has been done on Mark uh, the structure fits too well, so it does seem like that that is also part of actually Mark's own creation and not, uh, not um, something that he is drawing on from another source. So what does Mark do with ha lacking a lot of this material? So because the author of Mark believes Paul's kerygma, in other words, that Christ died in accordance with the scriptures, he was buried and was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, the author of Mark turned to the scriptures, by which we mean the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, because he didn't have any access to New Testament. They were still writing this. This is the first gospel to be written, to create a narrative of what he felt or what he believed must have taken place in the course of Jesus' life. So in other words, since Jesus' life was all in accordance with the scriptures, if we don't have the exact details of what happens in history, we don't have uh, eyewitnesses who are telling us, we do know at the very least is that every single thing that we read about in the, uh, in the scriptures in the Old Testament are things that must have happened. And so if I don't have the details, I can use those to fill in the blanks. So in so doing this, we kind of see that uh, the gospel right away has purposes other than history. So the author of Mark 
is not writing a history book, is not writing a biography. Instead, the gospel seeks to persuade readers that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, whose life uh, fulfilled scripture. And we can't go into how Mark does this, but I have a whole lecture uh, that we did at an Easter one time where I said, is Easter historical? And I invite you to go uh, rewatch that if you haven't seen that one. Um, uh, Mark's text includes no Christmas story. There's no nativity. Um, uh, and so there presumably was not any such story circulating for him uh, to write about, because if he knew a story of uh, Jesus' mother giving a virgin birth or anything like that, he probably would have put such a story into his text. Uh, instead, Mark's gospel begins uh, with Jesus' baptism. Okay, so now we're going to get to uh, where the Christmas stories are actually housed. The next gospels, Matthew and Luke. And so when those evangelists set out to write their gospels in the next decades, so the 80s or 90s, maybe 10, 20 years after Mark's text was written, they had more source material available to them. Specifically, they had Mark, uh, but they also had another text as well. So although these Gospels are attributed to Matthew and Luke, um, these Gospels are actually anonymous, and they are also not written by eyewitnesses. So both authors had access to Mark, and they also had access to a source that included uh, sayings of Jesus, a sayings gospel that's now been lost. This is a hypothetical source that is labeled Q by uh, scholars, and it has nothing to do with QAnon. It is an older use of the letter Q. Anyway, it means Kfella or source in German. Uh, biblical scholarship uh, was pioneered by German literary scholars. All right. So, Drawing upon uh, the text of Mark, like I say, there is no nativity story, there's no stories of Jesus' childhood in that source, and there's also no uh, stories of Jesus' childhood in the sayings, Gospel Q, it's primarily sayings. Um, nevertheless, Jesus' family is mentioned uh, in Mark uh, chapter 6, verse 3. So we read there, quote, isn't this, isn't Jesus the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? So these are people in the town of Nazareth who um, are shocked that uh, Jesus is um, uh, performing miracles and wonders and is embarked on this um, prophetic ministry because they're just saying, isn't this guy that carpenter we know? <laughs> you know, and so on. Uh, and isn't his Mary's son. So we're getting here anyway um, from Mark uh, uh, an idea that Jesus has family members, specifically that his mother is named Mary, and he's got four named brothers and some living sisters. Um, but one of the things that is interesting is in Mark's gospel, Jesus' family, apparently including his mother, they're hostile to his teachings. And so at a certain point in mean Mark chapter 3, um, they seek to take charge of him, claiming that he's out of his mind. So as he is doing things like um, casting out devils and things like that, uh, they are interpreting this as being out, of the, being out of his mind. And it causes a rift where Jesus essentially says, uh, my, my brothers and sisters are my disciples, not my family, at least as described, like I say, in Mark. So we do get a family presentation in Mark, even if we don't get uh, for the adult Jesus. Uh, but his father is not mentioned, so presumably out of the picture as far as Mark is concerned, um, and his fa family is antagonistic. <clears throat> Mark's portrayal of the disciples is also fairly unflattering. So often when Jesus is teaching or is telling a parable or something like that, um, the disciples don't understand what he's talking about and have to be taken aside, what are you talking about, this kind of thing. At a certain point, they all abandon him. Even his chief disciple, Peter, denies him three times when it counts. Um, but Jesus' brother, James, who we know from history, from Paul and Josephus, we know he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' death. He's not even included as a disciple in Mark's account. And so this may indicate that the author of Mark was hostile to the claims of James's church, that group that uh, had been expelled from Jerusalem when it was destroyed by the Romans and was off 
maybe uh, headquartered in Pella, uh, maybe is still a group of Judaizing uh, or Jewish Christians, uh, but again, Mark is perhaps uh, less from a different interpretation or a different group of Christians that are antagonistic. Okay, so working then from Mark's text, these anonymous evangelists, the authors of Matthew and Luke, have the same kind of issues that Mark had in constructing stories. There's still a bunch of gaps, uh, and how do you fill those gaps? And so lacking stories of Jesus' birth, they once again turn to the Hebrew Bible to provide unknown details using that same precept that I've uh, called upon here from Paul, this kerygma, that Jesus' life is in accordance with Scripture. So if we don't have the details, we can go to the Scriptures to, uh, to create the details or to fill in the blanks because, um, again, their understanding of it is, is that truth recurs. And so things that are in Scripture were lived out uh, by Jesus. So, for example, uh, there's two Christmas stories that derive from this. Uh, we often read these together, but they're actually very distinct depending on uh, which gospel uh, evangelist is telling it. So in Matthew's story, Joseph and his fiancée Mary live in Bethlehem. When Mary conceives a child from the Holy Spirit, an angel tells Joseph, hey, wait a second, don't divorce her. Uh, this is God's plan and so forth. Uh, in this portion of the story, or in Matthew's story, magi appear in response to a star. Uh, they go and visit uh, the king of Judea in Jerusalem, King Herod, who um, is not aware that uh, a Messiah has been born, but is very uh, dubious or worried about it because he doesn't want a rival who is going to be a rival king. Um, and that ultimately causes uh, Joseph and Mary and the family and Jesus to flee to Egypt. And so it's only after Herod dies uh, that the family leaves their Egyptian exile and moves up to Nazareth and Galilee. So they're not from Nazareth in Matthew's story, but they end up there as they are trying to stay away from Herod and then later his heirs. So Luke's Christmas story is a little bit longer, and it begins actually with the birth of John the Baptist to a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who is listed as a relative of Mary. So now uh, John the Baptist becomes Jesus' cousin, according to Luke's account. So Mary and her fiancé Joseph already live in Nazareth, in Luke's story, when an angel tells her that she will give birth to the Messiah. During her pregnancy, Joseph and Mary travel to Bethlehem in response to a Roman census decree. So in Luke's story, this is the story where there's no room at the inn, and that leads to the baby sleeping in a manger. Manger is a food trough. Rather than attracting the attention of magi and kings, angels appear to shepherds in Luke's account who then go and visit the newborn. Uh, later, and as the story progresses, Jesus is presented in the temple where prophets declare him the Messiah before then the family goes home to Nazareth, which is where they're from. So no uh, flight to Egypt. There's no sense that uh, uh, King Herod is uh, chasing after them because um, uh, uh, I mean, they're able to actually go to the temple where people are actually declaring, uh, where prophets and prophetesses are declaring that he's the Messiah. So it's a different and contradictory story. Okay, so I think that this gives us interesting insights into the process of the evangelists when they are composing their gospels, when they're composing scriptures. So for Christians in worship, these um, two stories tend to be synthesized and actually, apologists have created lots of traditions to reconcile them. So, um, you know, they, the Magi come many years later and so on. There's all kinds of different ways that this is uh, after they've already got a house as opposed to, um, uh, you know, like when they're trying to stay at the inn and so on. So, and in my family on Christmas Eve, and this is kind of a picture of one of our annual pageants back when I was three years old. I'm actually playing the little drummer boy who's not a canonical um, <laughs> part of the story, but in any event... Uh, my grandfather, Hamer, there is Joseph, and my sister is Mary. Um, anyway, we would read the story every year, and we would just jump back and forth between Matthew and Luke, just reading the verses that we like 
in the order we wanted to. So nevertheless, the contradictions between the accounts and also the kind of the minor agreements uh, between the accounts give insight into the creative processes of both evangelists. All right, so for one thing, um, uh, they both provide genealogies. So there is a um, Genesis style list of begets, so-and-so beget this and so beget that, or so-and-so is the son of this, the son of this, the son of this. Uh, and those are in um, both, there's one in Matthew and there's one in Luke. So Messiah, that name, anointed one, is a title for the king of Judah, whose royal family was called the house of David. That house uh, disappeared in the biblical account shortly after the Judean exiles returned from Babylon. So after the Babylonian captivity, uh, the last uh, kind of Davidic prince who's named Zerubbabel, um, and who's essentially been a little bit He's been in exile and he's already got a Babylonian name when he comes back. Um, he is a Persian provincial, uh, provincial official in the Persian Empire, but shortly after that he disappears from the account and the house of David, which has been at the center of the Bible story, is gone um, and isn't mentioned again then in the Hebrew Bible. So both Matthew and Luke provide, like I say, Bible-style genealogies for Jesus, making him a descendant of King David, which they knew he must be, since the scriptures say that the Messiah is of the house of David. So um, these are the two genealogies. I'm not going to read all of these names, um, but the issue between them is they are, you know, quite contradictory. Uh, and so um, what I have here in, in, in kind of white and bold are names that uh, Matthew and Luke, or the authors of Matthew and Luke, are drawing from uh, the biblical accounts all the way down to then anyway, Joseph and Jesus anyway, who's not otherwise in the Bible in the Old Testament. Um, uh, but for, uh, in all the other ones, these other names here that are uh, in blue and italics, these are names that are not known from any other source and are very likely then the invention of the authors here. And so, um, like I say, the Matthews one goes from David down to Zerubbabel and then creates a line of sons that take you from Zerubbabel to Joseph. Um, Zorobabel is also kind of mentioned. It's not sure if that's who Luke is meaning. It's kind of such a common, I mean, it's an uncommon name. <laughs> and so I kind of feel like it is, but it does make the generations much more complicated. Uh, and, and Luke also invents all uh, lineage for uh, that king. It's not necessarily necessary. So part of the problem is there's 27 generations on the one, 42 on the other. This is sometimes uh, explained through an apologetic that Luke's genealogy is actually Mar the genealogy of Mary, but it's very clearly not because uh, the Lucan account says, you know, Jesus is the son of Joseph, the son of Heli. So it is not the son of Mary, the son of, um, you know, Mary's dad or something like that. Uh, and so really what we're, we're not looking at that here when we're seeing these, um, th these genealogies. So it's not Matthew, it's not Joseph's and Mary's. So because the authors of Matthew and Luke believed Jesus' life fulfilled prophecy. They believed he was a descendant of David. But lacking documentation, both evangelists felt qualified to create genealogies that were ahistorical, styled on those begat lists that are in the Hebrew Bible, and which, by the way, in turn are also ahistorical. So all of the lists from Adam down to Adam begat so-and-so all the way down to uh, Moses, those are also ahistorical. Those are all talking about um, characters that are not char that are literary and not historical figures. Those are, of course, centuries older. However, so another that's a, that's a minor uh, agreement and also a minor disagreement. They agree. Uh, the two gospels agree that uh, Jesus is a descendant of David, but they disagree in the details. Right. Um, likewise, Bethlehem is Jesus' birthplace. The authors of Matthew and Luke are also agreed that since Jesus' life was lived according to the scriptures, he must have been born in Bethlehem. But they disagree as to why his parents were there, given that Jesus' the historical Jesus' hometown was Nazareth in Galilee. So 
The fact that Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth is one of the um, primary things that can actually be said with any much assurance about the historical Jesus. Um, it's because this detail is multiply attested in so many different sources without it having any, um, any relevance to a claim to be the Messiah. So Nazareth is a, no, a nothing village that had no, uh, no mention in the historical record at all before Jesus. And so there's no reason you'd go out of your way to make a big deal about saying this is the guy, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is a common, it's a Greek version of a common uh, Hebrew and Aramaic name. And um, anyway, and so he's identified in lots of the sources as being from this town. However, birth in Bethlehem is one of the biblical prophecies that Matthew explicitly says is fulfilled in Jesus. So when King Herod is asking his own chief priests and scribes where the Messiah would be born uh, after the Magi, after the Persian astrologers come and ask him, where is the guy, uh, where is the babe who was born, king of the Jews, that his chief scribes and priests say, they quote a messianic prophecy, prophecy that is recorded in the Hebrew Bible book of Micah. So Micah 5.2, and that reads in part, O Bethlehem, from you shall come forth for me the one who is to rule Israel. So both of the evangelists were faced with their understanding that Jesus um, lived according to the scriptures and therefore must have been born in Bethlehem because of that prophecy in Micah, even though they also knew that his hometown was Nazareth. So they each feel free to create explanations which end up being contradictory. So as we saw, Luke says they were just visiting. Matthew uh, has the move to Nazareth after uh, leaving Bethlehem. Okay, I'm going to also now look at uh, Matthew's story of the massacre of in innocents. In Matthew, Joseph and Mary live in Bethlehem but flee to escape the massacre of innocents ordered by Herod which Matthew states fulfilled a prophecy of Jeremiah. So he quotes Jeremiah saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they are no more. So this idea is that Herod has ordered all of the uh, boys in Bethlehem or maybe the whole area uh, to be killed so that uh, because he's been tricked by the Magi who did not tell him where Jesus was, not having Jesus, not wanting a rival, um, uh, according to Matthew's text and Matthew's text alone, uh, Herod orders this massacre of innocents, uh, which Matthew takes as being a fulfillment of this prophecy in Jeremiah. However, <laughs> if we go to the book of Jeremiah and look up the quotation, it's interesting to note that Jeremiah is not predicting that a future massacre of innocents would take place at the time of the Messiah's birth. Rather, the wailing that he recounts by Rachel, Rachel here is uh, the wife or one of the wives of the biblical uh, figure named Israel. So Rachel here is standing in for the nation of Israel, the mother. All of the mothers of the nation are mourning because the Babylonians have taken the exiles away into captivity. And so the prophet Jeremiah is living at that time when the kingdom of Judah is conquered by the Babylonians and the nobles are all taken away into the Babylonian exile and captivity. So um, a voice is heard in Ramah, uh, which is a staging ground for uh, the, the exiles to be taken away to Babylon, and, and Rachel uh, is weeping, not because of a future massacre, but because of that contemporary event. So um, Jesus' life, therefore, is actually being portrayed here as echoing Scripture. So although the, uh, in, not just about, not just in in response to predictions, right? So although the author of Matthew does not explicitly cite Exodus as the source for his massacre of the innocent story, um, there's a huge parallel here, right? Because in that book, in the book of Exodus, the baby Moses is saved from a similar massacre uh, that the Pharaoh orders when he's worried that there are too many uh, Hebrew slaves in Egypt. And so he orders that all the boys need to be massacred. 
and to save his life, Moses is put into the basket and is uh, floated on the Nile, right? Um, so for the evangelists, part of the fact, their idea anyway, that Jesus lived according to Scripture, part of that means more than simply fulfilling explicit prophecies about the Messiah. They're also saying that Jesus' life echoes Scripture in very important ways. Um, when this flight to Egypt happens, to escape that massacre, as I say, Matthew has Mary, Joseph, and Jesus flee from Judea to Egypt. And that also brings him to another one of these uh, fulfillments of Scripture as Matthew understands it. So he says, this is done to fulfill what has been spoken by the prophet, I'm um, sorry, by the Lord through the prophet, quote, out of Egypt, I have called my son. So the author of Matthew here is quoting the prophet Hosea, another Old Testament prophet. But the context, again, is not a messianic prophecy. This is not what Hosea is talking about. And by the way, Matthew knows you can go back and look this up. So, we I mean, the Bible <laughs> is there. So it's, a, it's not that he is deliberately misquoting prophecy. It's that he has a different understanding of what prophecy is uh, than we might have if we just think of it as literalistic prediction. So here's the actual um, context of Hosea's quotation and the quotation in context. So Hosea says, uh, reads, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me, they kept sacrificing to the Baals, to the idols. So in other words, um, God's son in this passage, out of Egypt I called my son, uh, is not the Messiah, it's not Jesus, um, it is uh, the whole people of Israel. And so therefore the author of Matthew is indicating um, that he is not uh, simply reading or understanding scripture literally, um, but something much, much more than that, right? Um, this also, uh, there's also a very, the last of these examples of Matthew's explicit quotations uh, has a, a bunch of other interesting implications. So Matthew's use of scripture uh, much earlier in his story, in his Christmas story, um, he says, in this case, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And then he quotes Isaiah. And he says, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which is God is with us. Um, so this has uh, uh, obviously becomes very important uh, in a lot of Christianity, this idea of uh, a virgin birth and Mary's virginity. Um, this is another point of minor agreement between the authors of Matthew and Luke. So in other words, Matthew and Luke are not getting the idea that Mary is a virgin from Mark, because if anything, Mark is quite hostile to Mary and to Jesus' family and so on. Um, there is not an indication uh, in any of Matthew and Luke's sources about this tradition. Um, Luke, when the author of Luke is crafting their gospel, they don't cite prophecies the same way that the author of Matthew does, but both are likely responding creatively to that same passage in Isaiah um, because it is, it's, it's, and it's interesting how that they are responding to it. So the passage that they're actually responding to is not the original Hebrew of Isaiah, but they're responding to the way it has been rendered in the Septuagint or the Greek translation that was used by all of the New Testament writers who are all writing in Greek. So in other words, they're not going back to reading the Hebrew. Um, the author of Luke may not even know Hebrew. Uh, they are instead operating entirely within the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. Um, if we go back to the Hebrew, um, the text is actually, and the context are actually quite different um, from how it's later understood by the Christians. So while the text had come to be interpreted as a messianic prophecy by Jesus' time, Isaiah is actually directly speaking to a king of Judah, King Ahaz, and he's likely predicting the birth of Ahaz's son, King Hezekiah, one of the most important uh, reformer kings in the history of uh, the development of Judaism. Um, so, uh, and so not a virgin birth, but rather Hezekiah, uh, Ahaz's son by one of Ahaz's wives, a young wife. 
Therefore, the Lord himself, we quote in this, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. And Emmanuel is Hebrew for God with us. So um, the evangelists were not historians. Their theological understanding of Jesus as living out scripture gave them license to create their sacred stories using scripture as a source. Historians agree that the nativity stories are the inventions of the evangelists and don't actually represent events that happened in the life of the historical Jesus. I would say even probably the most um, conservative, uh, what I'd call legitimate historians that I read are all pretty well agreed that the nativity stories um, are pretty much the invention of the, uh, the two evangelists. And one of the things that is probably much more likely is that the historical Jesus was born in Nazareth and not, for example, in uh, Jerusalem, despite the, uh, the prophecy and the way that people, uh, early Christians, would have liked it to have been. So I want to also, though, look at, so what do we do with that? <laughs> so, um, you know, so if you are approaching this as someone who's not a Christian, if you're secular and you're just interested in, uh, in how the Bible works and how it operates, you know, that's great. And you can probably, this is probably all you need to worry about. If you are, though, um, uh, Christian, I would say that in, your own, in, in, Christ, in the own use of Scripture, early Christian evangelists illustrate that the importance of what they were doing was the message rather than historicity or literalism. Um, they are not um, writing these, they are not writing their texts uh, interpreting the, they're using their own ter- interpretation of scripture, they're not interpreting that literally. They are uh, having a much um, uh, broader and more imaginative use of scripture and how Jesus' life lived out scripture. Um, it's topological, it is about echoes and so on, but it's not about literalism. And they also are not historians, and the point of it is not actually historicity. So in my view, when Christians today read New Testament scripture as a literal history, they're not only misunderstanding the actual history, um, more importantly, I think they're losing sight of the evangelist's intended message. So in my own church, uh, the sacred story of Christmas is something that is part of the living church experienced annually in the sacred Christian calendar. It exists now and here in the living church. So it's not about the birth of a historical Jesus and a past era that's dead and gone, but about the living Christ who was born into the world each year at the advent, at the end of Advent and Christmas, uh, and who exists uh, when the body of Christ exists uh, as the Christian community. And so that is my take on, uh, on uh, prophecy in the Christmas stories. If you are interested in um, how we live that out in our church, you can always come to our Christmas Eve service. That's going to be on December 24th at 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, But this is the end of the formal presentation, and I'm wondering if we have started to have questions. And if you're not also, if you haven't written one yet, I, um, we're gonna stick, stick around. And if you have questions for any of these details or my conclusions or anything like that, please do. Um, so, <clears throat> so Bob Garrison writes, was Paul setting out to start a new religion? Um, in general, it's very rare for anybody to claim to be starting a new religion. And, uh, and it's often quite rare for anybody to um, uh, to even think they're starting a new religion. Um, One of the interesting things about religion is um, people prefer to have it be um, very, very ancient. And so usually what people are trying to do is uh, is understand a good news within an existing religion. So I don't think that Paul would have thought of this as a new religion. It's rather the ancient religion that has existed back since the the stories of the creation, but there is now good news. And in fact, actually, he's considering it to be end times. He's quite a literal uh, believer that the end of the world is at hand. Um, So it's maybe a new uh, message within an existing religion. 
you know, this happens too in, in our tradition here in, in Community of Christ. So the community, our, our movement is called the Restoration. Um, and, the, and the whole, when the church was founded, we specifically didn't use the word founded because it's not a new church. What we are saying is that the church is organized. It was the same old church that was started by, by Jesus in our understanding of it, but with that church had simply been disorganized and now we've organized it again uh, or reorganized it again too. Uh, and as opposed to, but it's not new, it's the same old church. So, so I would say, no, he's not trying to do that. Um, so uh, Owen McGrandall says, how do we know uh, the letters of Paul uh, weren't written by the actual historical figures? No, so the other letters, not the, not the Paul letters. So how do we know that, um, um, how do we know, I'm sorry, how do we know the letters of James and Peter and Jude are not written by them? Um, so uh, we've had lectures on this, but it's a, um, uh, it, there's a whole bunch of different ways where, where texts can be kind of authenticated or not. So a text will have anachronisms, a text will make different kinds of errors and so on. A text is clear, and a text will date to some time that's clearly later than it's possible. A text will um, have details in it that are later than, for example, when James was still alive and so on. Uh, and so the chronology, the chronology will be off that makes it impossible for it to be uh, the actual figure and so on. In the case of one of these, um, one of these that I referenced, uh, Second Peter, Second Peter, um, although it claims uh, that it's written by the Apostle Peter, um, it is very clearly a reworking and expansion of the epistle of Jude. Um, so they take the same text um, change the context, rework it, and expand it, and make it all uh, make it a new letter. But it's not an all new letter. It has the same Jude text embedded in it, uh, and so that's one of the ways we can tell that Peter did not write that. Um, and so we just don't have those kind of autographic um, accounts from uh, eyewitnesses. Uh, Theophilus uh, writes: Apparently, there was a gospel according to the histories, hi Hebrews, written in Hebrew letters. Uh, which seems to conform to Matthew minus uh, chapters one to two of a proto-Matthew gospel. So, um, so there are a bunch of, um, there were several uh, gospels that are lost. Uh, I mentioned the gospel of the Ebionites. There's also references to a gospel, like you say, of the Hebrews. Um, uh, so we don't have those, and so all we have is what the enemies have written about them, and so um, it's not even particularly known if the Gospel of Hebrews is different from uh, the Gospel of the Ebionites. Uh, like you say, one of the descriptions here of uh, Gospel of Hebrews is that it's just like Matthew, but missing the first couple chapters. Um, and if, it, if so, and if it was written in Hebrew, it would be a Hebrew translation of, of Matthew, because the text of Matthew is actually composed first in Greek. Um, so even though an early Christian witness, uh, Papias, said that, uh, that the gospel was first written in, uh, in our language, in Aramaic, and then translated into, into the Greek, um, the literary analysis of that doesn't show that to be the case. Um, so Bob says, Bob Garrison says, if Mark was the first gospel written, why does Matthew appear first in the Bible? Uh, and the answer to that is because early Christians didn't realize that Mark was the first <laughs> gospel written. And so for a whole long time, people um, believed that Matthew's gospel was written first. Um, that has been pretty well, um, there's still a, a minority position that's quite, um, I think at this point, pretty small. Uh, people who try to hold out for that. Uh, but um, at this point, it's very hard to argue. There's a, um, I have a whole, uh, lecture on the synoptic question. It's called the Lost Gospel Q um, that explains essentially why there's Mark in priority, why Mark's gospel has to be first as opposed to uh, Mark being this radical reduction of Matthew's gospel. Um, just the kind of, and one of the just simple arguments is sort of if uh, Matthew's gospel is first and Mark is just kind of copying from it and just taking bits of it, he throws away a lot of good stuff, like for example, the Sermon on the Mount and stuff like that. And it's hard to um, really understand why uh, Mark is kind of throwing so much of this good stuff away to make his short version. Um, yeah, Daryl Scott says, what is the Christian explanation for why Jesus is not named Emmanuel? 
Um, and so again, uh, for, for a literalist, that should be a problem, I would think. You know, so so you'd think that that um, that prophecy as read should mean, man, Jesus's name should have been Emmanuel because you're supposed to call his name Emmanuel. Um, so again, what I would say is that this is uh, uh, this is not. Anyway, it's not to it's not actually be taken literally. Um, even even in Isaiah's time, when Isaiah is making this uh, uh, this symbolic name for King Ahaz's son, King Ahaz's son ultimately is called Hezekiah. So the prophecy, um, the the point of the name is to is actually not literalistic. It's actually to uh, to talk about um, uh, how important uh, this son, ultimately now reinterpreted messianically, is. You know, in other words, that. Uh, in the Christian understanding of it, um, the Christ is God with us. So the name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel is essentially a, um, a synonym for Christ. Um, but like you say, um, if you were a literalist, you'd want you'd say, well, why, well, why isn't he named Emmanuel since he's named Jesus for, for who knows why? <laughs> so uh, Sean writes, um, are the canonical gospels... Uh, the most trustworthy information we have about the historical Jesus. Um, the, the, uh, the synoptic gospels are the most reliable sources for, that we have for the historical Jesus for the most part. Uh, there's very little historical or information that we can pull from John, which is, um, uh, which is kind of what most people I think agree is much more removed from uh, the historical Jesus. And there's maybe you can maybe glean the same kind of uh, information from from Thomas as you could gain from John. But yes, essentially from uh, Mark and Q especially, um, but then also some of the additional things that are included in Matthew and Luke is probably where the uh, the most the closest information we have to the historical Jesus. Um, OG tab. How would um, the Gnostics view the birth of Christ? So, um, so the Gnostics are are much more. Um, uh, so the Gnostics are much more uh, concerned about um, Jesus as, uh, let's say, an, an emanation and Jesus's uh, um, uh, godly qualities as opposed to the human qualities. Uh, anytime you're uh, the, the Gnostics are are less positive about. Uh, the physical world and physical creation, um, and what we're trying to essentially um, liberate ourselves from the materiality and get back to uh, the true divine presence, which is entirely uh, spiritual. And so, um, there's they would probably much prefer um, uh, the beginning instead of the Christmas story. They might much prefer. The, uh, the story found at the beginning of the Gospel of John, and the beginning was the Word, God's Word, and, uh, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, or entered flesh is probably what they prefer, and, and dwelt among us for the purposes of bringing us back to uh, the true God, right? So, um, so that's probably how it would be different as a, as a birth story. There probably are, I'm trying to think, I'd have to, I'd have to think about like a, you know, there's several Gnostic texts, and so there may be, they're mostly theological, so they're more like a Genesis story than they're like a nativity story. Um, Ron Wagner says, the Gospel of John doesn't mention anything about the birth of Jesus. Well, like I said, I was just quoting that. Um, um, it says that uh, it more or less retells the Genesis story. It indicates that um, Jesus, or is Christ, the pre-existent logos or word of God that is present uh, with God at the at the beginning, when a God, the Creator, uh, says, "Let there be light," and that word, then that logos, that emanating glory, that word is um, Christ, who is also God, uh, according to John. And then it says that, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so, in other words, that's that's the. Um, it's not a it's not a childhood story. It's a theological story for. Um, a kind of a Jesus origin story for a much more divine Jesus that uh, is portrayed in the Gospel of John. People are also asking about the <laughs> the spiral behind me, and so this is a. Um, a are you going to pull out? <laughs> so this is um, uh, the spiral is a symbol of. Um, 
uh, for us in our own church, Community of Christ, of the path of the disciple, the worshiper's path, as we are uh, on a spiritual journey together, we are hopefully um, uh, ascending uh, as we are learning more and continuing learning and growing as disciples. Um, we have at the center of it is peace, and that's our peace seal of the lion and the lamb and the child shall lead. And then there's also a cross that figures into it and radials and so on. And so that's a, um, a symbol, one of the symbols of our church and so part of, uh, part of the sanctuary here at Center Place. All right, do we have other questions or we're, all right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we'll have to tell, we're trying to make these um, uh, shorter forms so that we can do them more frequently. So maybe if you respond what you think about that, this kind of format, what I'm trying to do is aim it for uh, like a 40, 45 minute uh, topic on a, on a shorter topic that we can then interact with like we've done in the questions. I thank you so much for uh, all of these questions and this very good discussion and I wish you happy holidays and a Merry Christmas.